Hey guys, Paul here, and I've had the Woodmaster 38 inch drum sander in my shop for, oh, I'd say a month or so now, and I've had plenty of time to play with it and get a feel for its capabilities and so forth, and I've come up with uh, 10 key points that I wanted to share with you, and without further ado, I'm gonna just dive right in. All right, the first item I wanna talk about is kind of to set your expectations about the state of the material or the preparation that you should have done on the material before you run it through here. So this is not a substitute for a jointer or a planer. You should be running stock or glued up pieces through here that have already been flattened. So S4S material. So uh, this is going to be great for sanding flat uh, doors that have been glued up or uh, panels that have been glued up and you want to flush those joints. Um, anything that's rough and you want to smooth out. But if you've got material that's bowed or cupped or twisted, don't expect this to flatten it. Take care of that first using a jointer, planer, hand plane, any combination that you use to sequence your material through to S4S. Do that first and then run it through here to expect it to get smooth very quickly and a good quality. All right, the second item I want to address is the, the depth of cut or the speed of stock removal. So if you have a mindset like you would with a planer, for instance, like I've got a big Woodmaster 718 planer and I can remove up to an eighth inch of stock in one pass. It's amazing what you can do with a planer. Don't take that mindset over to your drum sander because even though this is a five horsepower machine, it's really powerful. And for a drum sander, it does remove stock quickly, but drum sanders just aren't like planers in that respect. So you have to think here in increments of one hundredth of an inch. So a hundredth of an inch per pass is about that much turn of the crank. So that was maybe an eighth of a rotation or so. And so you have to keep that mindset and, and even at that, a hundredth of an inch for, for a narrow uh, piece of material that you'd run through, you might run that through twice to remove that one hundredth of an inch. If you had a super wide panel maxing out at 38 inches width across the entire drum, you might do that 100th inch in three passes over the drum. So it's, it, for a drum sander, it's fast, but just don't take your planar mindset over to the drum sander and you'll be just fine. All right, one of the questions that I had when I started using the machine is, okay, it's got infinitely variable feed rate, and that's really cool, but how do I know where to start, right? So it's nice to have the ability to dial into exactly where you want. So the good guideline here is that, and this is right out of the manual, is that you're wanting, you're gonna to wanna to run sort of as a starting point at three quarter speed and go up from there. So I found that on some materials I could go full speed and it was fine. You run a little bit of wider material, you may wanna slow it down a little bit. But if you slow it down too much, that's when you can run into problems. You're gonna have heat generating, uh, and that can cause a, a couple problems. One, burning. Uh, if I had some cherry that I ran through, and, it, and I ran it through a little too slow, and I saw some burning. Uh, it also can actually, that heat can cause the grain to raise, so you could be running through uh, at slow speeds thinking you're smooth, gonna smooth out the panel and it keeps feeling uh, knobby on, on the surface. And, and so you think, well, why is this sanding tool not removing that? So it's actually creating heat, which is producing that kind of whiskering effect. So uh, three quarters or higher speed and you should be in the, kind of in the sweet spot range. All right, I mentioned uh, in the setup video that I added the uh, reversing switch onto the machine, and I think that is such a cool feature. Strongly recommend it. Um, the big advantage is you can stay in one spot, feed the machine through, have it return back to you. All right, the next area I want to talk about is stock thickness. Now, my friend Charlie, who's a master woodworker, says that the main reason that he loves having a drum sander is for uh, sanding flat 
veneer that he cuts on his bandsaw. I'm a furniture guy as well. I love that application. So the uh, this machine is really nicely designed for that application because you can go down to super thin. The max thickness is five and a half inches and there's really no minimum thickness that it can handle. Now what I found in sanding this, this is about oh, 10 or 11 inch wide walnut veneer. I sanded this that I cut on my bandsaw and I sanded it down to 1 16th inch exactly and it's consistent from edge to edge. Um, and it handled this just fine just running it through without any support. Now, I didn't go any thinner than that because I never do. Uh, I never create veneer thinner than that. I usually actually go a little bit thicker than that. I just kind of wanted to see how thin I could go and keep the piece intact. And it had no problem with this. Now, when I had a conversation with the, with the engineer at Woodmaster, he said that once you go thinner than a 16th inch, you can start to see a waviness in the material. And he said, you're going to want to put it on a carrier board, a support board to support it from underneath as you pass it through uh, the, the sander. And then you can go thinner than that, as thin as you dare, really. It, then it becomes a matter of how thin can the material withstand and still hold together before it starts to just kind of crumble apart. But 1 16th inch was absolutely no problem and really a neat application for uh, a drum sander. The next area I want to talk about is just a kind of a maintenance item that you want to keep an eye on uh, because it is important in terms of the performance of the machine and it's super easy to adjust. You know, the, the conveyor belt should last many, many, many years uh, and probably for a, uh, an occasional user of a drum sander like me, it should last the life of the machine. And, and so, but in order to do that, one of the things you want to do is keep an eye on the tracking. Now in normal uh, operation, you shouldn't have to adjust that uh, very often, if at all. If you do use the reversing switch, you're going to want to uh, make an adjustment periodically. And it's really simple to keep an eye on one simple thing. There's a wheel that is your guide uh, on the right side of the infeed, and it should be just up against that wheel in operation. So just run it and keep an eye on it and see that it is uh, contacting that wheel. If it's up against it too hard and it's and the, the conveyor belt is curling under a little bit, then it's over too far to the right. If it's not touching it, if there's a sizable gap, uh, then you want to move it over uh, just a little bit. So the process of doing this is so simple. Uh, you're going to just uh, loosen up each of these adjustment uh, nuts, one on each side, and the suggestion is to, uh, if it's off by a lot, and I'm going to just get make it off by a lot for this demonstration, uh, and you just open those up four turns. I've marked the top of each nut just for my visual alignment purpose, so I'm going to just loosen it up four turns, slide it over, I'm going to make it out of adjustment, and then I'll just show you. It's really easy to just slide it back, bring it up just into contact with that, and then tighten each of them back down, those same four turns. Then you're going to want to run it for two to three minutes on full speed and make sure that it's still aligned. And there's an easy way to adjust it. Uh, it's, it's covered in the manual. You're going to make an adjustment uh, using, the, um, using the same nuts and go a quarter turn at a time, no more than a half turn. A little bit, because you don't want to overdo it. It takes a little bit for that tension to kind of settle back in and make sure that it's tracking properly. And once it's set, then again, it should, it should be fine for quite a long time. Uh, but you want to keep an eye on that wheel and the position relative to the wheel. So the positioning of that, just so you know, is makes it so that it's not perfectly centered. It is situated just a little bit to the right rather than perfectly centered. But that wheel is just such a great kind of guide for you. Just keep an eye on that and the tracking should not be a problem. 
All right, next area I want to touch on is dust collection. Now, I've been a big advocate for, for good dust collection in a shop for decades now, and there is, you know, one of the most challenging tools to collect from is a drum sander. Why? Well, look how wide that, that drum and conveyor is. That's 38 inches wide. That's a big space to collect from. And the volume of dust that a machine like this is capable of producing is staggering. So you're gonna to wanna to have a minimum of two horsepower uh, dust collection and keep the run, your duct run, as short as possible. And that will really maximize the air draw from this. Now, another thing that I would suggest, if you have space in your shop, and I don't, unfortunately, but if you have space in your shop, a dedicated dust collector for a drum sander would be a great way to go. And I don't even recommend uh, using a cyclone. I would recommend using a bag system. Yeah, you're gonna have to knock the dust off once in a while, maybe frequently, but cyclones are not great at separating uh, air and dust uh, coming, out of a, coming out of a drum sander. And I have a good one, and I've had several good ones in here. This is the one thing that they do have a challenge with. So, so the goal uh, should be at a minimum to keep the air clean. And, and beyond that, as much as the dust collector can pull from the, uh, from the sandpaper and drum area and so forth, the better. But you probably are not gonna get perfect with a drum sander, so just be prepared for that. Do the best that you can, follow good dust collection uh, kind of practices, and you should be just fine. All right, next area I wanna hit on is just some uh, maintenance that you're gonna to wanna to do on the machine periodically. This is very well covered in the manual, and I'm not gonna cover everything here, but I'm just gonna call out a few specific ones that I know you're gonna to wanna to keep an eye on. And some of this comes from my experience with the, the Woodmaster 718 uh, planer drum sander combination that I've been using and maintaining for about 10 years now, so I've got a feel for that. So uh, the few areas that I'll call out, first of all, uh, you're gonna to wanna to just use compressed air to just kind of blow everything out from time to time, just to move dust that can build up and cause problems. So that's a good, good habit. As you're doing that specifically, you're going to want to hit the, uh, the corner screws that the jack post screws that raise and lower the conveyor. Uh, those you'll notice over time will get, it'll not adjust as smoothly as when it's brand new and you'll know it's time to clean and lubricate it. So for cleaning, again, compressed air works great. For lubricating, Woodmaster recommends uh, uh, graphite powder uh, or packing grease into the threads of those rods. Uh, what I use is something that I use for a lot of machine maintenance in my shop, and that's just a, a dry lube. And I'll give you a link to this, but there are a lot of different products like this on the market. Uh, this is a Teflon-based product, and I just, after the those uh, screws are good and clean with compressed air. I'll just put a good copious uh, amount of this dry lube spray on there and kind of work it in a little bit and it it seems to work great then for a while. This is not, there's not a ton of use on that as you're uh, raising and lowering it. It's not like a high speed part so this seems to work pretty well between um, you know between applications. I probably use this every couple weeks on my uh, on my plane and I'd expect I'll probably do the same here. You also want to periodically wipe down your pinch rollers with alcohol and also use a 3-in-1 machine oil to lubricate the brass bushings that you'll find in the machine. Now here's a helpful tip for quality and efficiency. Make yourself a plywood template at the correct angle for cutting your abrasives and then the next time you need to cut it just lay it down on top of your abrasive, make the cut and you're ready to go. All right, then one final area would be in-feed and out-feed support. Now, Woodmaster does sell as an add-on accessory that I don't have here, uh, in-feed and out-feed extension uh, tables or rollers. That's a good idea if you're going to be running a lot of longer material through. Uh, that can really help 
you know, just give you better quality uh, and make your life a little bit easier so you're not the in-feed and out-feed support uh, as much. So without that, you could use, you know, freestanding rollers and those can help uh, to an extent like I have here. Um, but if this is gonna be a frequent thing for you, it might be worth uh, just adding that accessory onto your machine. All right, that's kind of a quick flyover based on my one month of uh, experience having the Woodmaster 3875 in my shop. Let me know if you have questions down below. I'll answer anything I can and I hope you'll subscribe and come back for more. I do a lot of woodworking, wood turning, and power tool related videos.